In the history of the world, no non-essential habit ever got so entrenched so fast. 70 million Americans smoke. Today they got a message from the United States Surgeon General who has had a blue ribbon committee studying their habit for 14 months. Out of its long and exhaustive deliberations, the committee has reached the overall judgment that cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to the United States to warrant remedial action. This overall judgment was supported by many converging lines of evidence as well as by data indicating that cigarette smoking is related to higher death rates in a number of disease categories. More specifically, the committee states on page 61 of the report, and I quote, in view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is a judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That was Dr. Luther Terry, the Surgeon General, opening the report of his advisory committee on smoking and health. The committee was set up to look over the whole smoking situation and to tell the government and the nation what can reasonably be said to be fact. After a year and two months, they did so. Their conclusions were firm and unanimous. The committee report raises issues that could involve government, industry, advertising media, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television. In subsequent broadcasts, CBS News will explore these issues at length. In this half hour, we will confine ourselves to the report itself, what it says, how its authors reached their conclusions, and the merits of their findings as seen by parties directly involved in the issue. This is a CBS News Extra on smoking and health. The findings of the Surgeon General's Committee. Men have been looking meaningfully at girls through curling smoke ever since the movies were invented. The girl with the cigarette was an early symbol of emancipated womanhood, although some purists say that women have always brought more enthusiasm than grace to the art of smoking. Almost all of our folk heroes smoked, even under tension, and even when they had to roll their own. We accepted it all in art because, as the jingle says, cigarettes have meant a lot, and in the half century or so in which they progressed from novelty to prevalence, they have meant progressively more to more people. Almost from the moment that cigarettes were introduced, they were attacked. But the attacks took a new turn 10 years ago and culminated in today's report by the Surgeon General's Committee. This, in summary, is what the committee says. Cigarette smoking is a major cause of lung cancer in men, and data on women smokers points the same way. Cigarette smoking is a significant cause of cancer of the larynx, and probably the most important cause of chronic bronchitis. Cigarette smoking may be related to other lung diseases. Male smokers have a much higher death rate from heart disease, although it's not proven that smoking is the cause. On the question of filters, the committee says there is no evidence that they do any good, but it didn't exclude the possibility that an effective filter might be developed. In short, the committee says if you smoke cigarettes, you increase your chances of dying early. The sooner you start, the more you smoke, the more you inhale, the worse your chances are. The Surgeon General's Committee presented its report at a news conference in Washington, and Surgeon General Terry and other committee members then answered questions about their findings. Well, I I think in this respect, and this is one reason that we are making an individual distribution to the physicians, I think that each physician must make an individual judgment on it. Of course, he should utilize this report and any other information which he has available to him. But I think in order for the report to be most effective in whatever direction it is effective, it will depend upon the judgment not only of the medical profession throughout the country, but of many other involved agencies. Secretary, smoking uh, is being called by many, uh, more and more medical men, the great new epidemic of the mid-20th century. I'd like to ask Dr. Burdett if he could come up for a second using the microphone and define for us the committee's own feelings about how serious a public health problem (coughs) smoking is. Dr. Burdett, would you? (laughs) 
I think you, you could define this in terms of numbers. Uh, in the case of a carcinoma of the lung, where the mortality ratios are the highest, there are about 41,000 deaths. And the committee, uh, in this instance, feels that the major causal factor is smoking. Uh, in uh, other areas, uh, the relationship is not so clear cut. Uh, does this answer your question? You hear the direct causal relationship is now established. This is what uh, many men weren't satisfied with before. Yes, uh, we have, uh, I think I'm speaking for the remainder of the committee. We have felt that uh, uh, in the case of uh, cancer of the lung, and uh, there are other types of cancers mentioned here, also in bronchitis and emphysema, I believe, that there is a direct ca causal relationship. This, is, this conclusion is based on converging evidence of several different types. I think, I think Dr. Bardet might point out in addition to that uh, as a comparison when he speaks of 41,000 deaths from carcinoma of the lung in this country per year that uh, the number of deaths from automobile accidents uh, last year, I believe, was around 38,000. This is only for some comparative substance. There's one other point that I would like to make clear. Dr. Guthrie apparently uh, felt that in my answer to the question about my advice to a person on smoking indicated that I would advise that person to continue to smoke. This I did not mean. I would advise anyone to cut, to discontinue smoking cigarettes. But if he were to continue smoking cigarettes, uh, he should do so in appreciation of the health hazard. Would you advise children to start? I certainly would advise children not to start. A question was addressed to the Assistant Surgeon General, James M. Hundley. Are the materials uh, which cause cancer, have, been, have they been identified? And if not all of them, how many? Some of the substances in tobacco smoke which the committee believes have been established to be carcinogenic have been identified. There are some, you'll find in the report, some seven hydrocarbons of this character. However, the committee also believes that there are many substances in tobacco smoke that may be related to this problem that have not yet been identified because the identified substances in the smoke do not account by quite a margin for the total carcinogenicity of the tobacco tars. The Surgeon General's committee was appointed as a culmination of a long series of attacks on smoking. In the 1930s, doctors began getting worried about the increase in lung cancer rates. In the early 1950s, the first extensive statistical studies showing a relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer appeared, and new studies have appeared periodically since. The British government accepted the link as established some time ago and began an official campaign against smoking, particularly among young people. During all this time, pressure on the United States government to step into the issue kept growing. One thing can be predicted about any crisis of American opinion, a committee will be formed. But the issue of smoking and health affected so many interests so strongly that even this step took a while. The Surgeon General, Dr. Luther L. Terry, announced the formation of the committee a year and a half ago. We plan to set up a committee of uh, approximately 12 uh, persons of scientific type uh, to evaluate the evidence at hand today in terms of the magnitude and the nature of any health effects of smoking. Uh, we are in the process of selecting and getting uh, these people appointed to the committee and will expect in uh, a very short time to be able to announce the members of this committee. Some people already convinced about the issue called the Surgeon General's group the Flat Earth Committee, a jury summoned to decide officially if the earth was really round. But most partisans on both sides of the question welcomed the step. The president of the Tobacco Institute, George V. Allen, was among them. that the government of the United States, acting through the Surgeon General, should appoint as uh, intelligent and uh, reputable a committee as a, a group 
study group as it can possibly find. Uh, to go into this matter as fully as it can and to uh, winnow out the chair, uh, to have a broad enough perspective, however, to consider all the factors, not only that uh, in, in relation to smoking and tobacco, but uh, other matters which have been things, causes which have been suggested as, as possible uh, reasons for lung cancer or heart disease and other matters. We think that it's very timely and we are very glad that it's being done. On this note of approbation from tobacco industry spokesmen and anti-cigarette crusaders alike, the committee finally assembled some 14 months ago. These men, each an expert in his field, were brought together from different parts of the country and from different fields of science. Dr. Walter Burdett of Surgery, the University of Utah. Dr. John B. Hickam, Internal Medicine, Indiana, non-smoker. Dr. Emmanuel Farber, Pathology, Pittsburgh, non-smoker. Dr. Stanhope Bain Jones, Yale School of Medicine, non-smoker. Dr. Leonard M. Schumann, Public Health, Minnesota, cigarette smoker. Dr. Charles Lamastra, Preventive Medicine, Texas, pipe smoker. Professor William G. Cochran, Statistics, Harvard, cigarette smoker. Professor Louis G. Fieser, Chemistry, Harvard, cigarettes and pipe. Dr. Jacob Firth, Pathology, New York, non-smoker. Dr. Morris H. Seavers, Pharmacology, Michigan, non-smoker. Assistant Surgeon General James Hundley, a pipe smoker, was acting chairman in the absence of the Surgeon General. And Dr. Eugene Guthrie, who quit smoking some years ago, was staff director. The committee was not called upon to do any new research. It would conduct no tests of its own, only study and evaluate all existing evidence collected by other researchers throughout the long course of the health controversy. The big question, would it, could it, clear the air of the uncertainties and disputes surrounding the issue? Meeting at frequent intervals in an isolated basement room of the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland, Sifting and evaluating thousands of reports and research studies, all available literature on smoke, smoking, tobacco, and disease, the committee pondered the evidence, often in the haze of its own tobacco smoke. This morning, in Washington, the committee assembled once more. Dr. Burney, in his uh, report in the JAMA of uh, November 28, 1959, said that no method of treating tobacco or filtering the smoke has been demonstrated to be effective in materially reducing or eliminating the hazard of lung cancer. Is this the view of this committee as well? It is my understanding that the committee still has that view insofar as having any proof of any way of treating. I'd like to ask Dr. Hundley to speak to that. There simply is no evidence which will establish the fact that filters have had any effect in reducing the health hazards of cigarette smoking. Uh, Dr. Terry, uh, excuse me. Dr. Terry, yeah. well, did uh, the committee <coughs> arrive at all of the major conclusions unanimously, or was there any division of opinion on any major conclusions? This I explored with the committee just this morning to reassure myself. <laughs> I have been assured that these are unanimous recommendations and conclusions of the committee. Dr. Terry, uh, can you tell us about when you expect uh, government action to be taken on this report and if action can currently be taken by the government to discourage smoking without legislation? Frankly, I, I, it would be, uh, I think, inappropriate for me to, uh, and certainly probably misleading, for me to attempt to tell you when it will be. On the other hand, I have every indication to believe that within our department, the Department of Health, Education, Welfare, and in other departments, this matter is considered of, of such significance and such importance that I do not believe there will be any foot dragging in terms of exploring what actions are appropriate for individual agencies and departments. Did uh, the committee find any report which raises a doubt about smoking as a cause of lung cancer? The committee considered all sorts of evidence, opinions, judgments, 
And I'm sure it's no news to you that there are people in this country who do not think that, or think that cigarette smoking is not a cause of lung cancer. We were fully aware of this and reached the judgment we did despite these other In other opinions. words, this is a very firm uh, conclusion. Indeed, I regard it as a very firm conclusion. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Schumann called it uh, utterly firm judgment. Uh, in other words, uh, would you say that anyone who regards uh, the point as not having been reasonably proved is unreasonable? <laughs> I think that would be fair to say, yes. <laughs> that response, that there is no reasonable doubt about cigarettes as a cause of lung cancer, strikes directly at the argument that the tobacco industry and some medical people have made during the controversy. What they have maintained is this, that even when cigarette smokers get lung cancer, it may be something other than smoking that caused it, something like air pollution, for example, or a virus. The Surgeon General's report dismisses these other factors as relatively minor. This puts a heavy burden of response on the tobacco industry. The six major companies, plus more than 20 smaller ones, that produce the 66 different brands and sizes of cigarettes. More than a third of them, this shorter stack here, knew since the health issue heated up 10 years ago. In our studio this afternoon, following the Surgeon General's news conference, CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hodlett put some questions to one of the leading spokesmen for the industry, Howard Coleman, president of the Tobacco Merchants Association and a longtime director of the Philip Morris Company. Mr. Coleman, prominent in the New York theater and civic affairs, is a third generation member of a tobacco family. Mr. Coleman, their conclusions are pretty stark and, and pretty solid. They say uh, quite flatly, the, they express the judgment that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. And then they have the rate that 10 times as high for smokers in the case of lung cancer and rather higher in other cases. Well, it's awful hard to define the word substantial. Uh, I don't believe that most people who smoke uh, get lung cancer. Uh, we are now in an era, as you know, of moderation. We eat more carefully, we have cholesterol habits, uh, we have drinking habits of lighter whiskey, we have smoking habits, which incidentally are today changing the type of cigarettes from regular cigarettes to fillers. Now, I was surprised at the beginning of the conference when Dr. Terry is supposed to have said that they have very little evidence, if any, on the effect, if any, of filler cigarettes. So when we have today 60% of the business in the filler field compared to 3% 10 years ago, I think we need a little more research. I'm convinced that eventually they will find some element through a filter or through leaf growing or a special type of seed growing that will eliminate the mysterious thing they're looking for. We want to be the detectives just as much as the Surgeon General of the AMA. We'll cooperate in every way. Well, are you saying then, sir, that uh, there is something toxic about tobacco or which are removable by filter? Well, obviously a filter takes out certain tar and nicotine. Uh, I don't think the industry admits there are any bad elements. If there are bad elements, through our laboratories, through the Surgeon General, through the AMA, through acts of God and luck, we hope we may find them. And if they are found, they will be removed. But at this point, we do not know. Now, does any of the research that the tobacco industry has been engaged in refute any part of the findings here or the conclusions as a whole? Well, without reading the report, I couldn't uh, answer that to begin with. I don't think the tobacco industry as a whole agrees with the conclusions. The question of whether danger can, in fact, be filtered out of cigarettes is a critical one, both for the industry and for the smoker. Against majority feeling within the industry, some companies have been openly pursuing this line of approach and thereby acknowledging the presence of danger, at least by implication. One of the men involved who has been conducting research for Liggett and Myers is Dr. C.J. Kensler, a pharmacologist. He was interviewed this afternoon by CBS News correspondent Dave Dugan. Dr. Kensler, the Assistant Surgeon General, Dr. Hundley, says that there is no evidence at this time that filters have any effect in reducing the hazards of smoking. Do you have any evidence to the contrary in your work? Well, Dr. Hundley, I'm sure, was referring to the fact that filters haven't been in use long enough for him to have any evidence on this point. However, 
some experimental evidence, i.e. Uh, experiments done chemically and on animals, suggest that filters uh, definitely may have an effect. And I refer to uh, the development in the last few years uh, of the information leading to the recognition that cigarette smoke uh, has a gas phase, i.e. the invisible gases, not the tar and the nicotine, which is of potential importance. Uh, there are components of this uh, gas phase, such as phenol, which can be selectively removed, and there are other, and phenol is on the list of promoting agents which may be involved in carcinogenesis. Cancer. Cancer producing agents. And uh, secondly, uh, components of the gas phase which inhibit, are capable of inhibiting ciliary motility. That is the self-cleansing action of the cells lining the tubes in the lung. These gases, a lot of them, can be removed uh, or, uh, so that the impairment of this self-cleansing process, presumably, can be greatly reduced. The role of the medical profession in the smoking and health controversy has been itself somewhat controversial. A number of state medical associations have issued warnings about the health hazards, but the American Medical Association, the national body, has been accused of foot-dragging on the issue. Today in Miami, CBS News reporter Nelson Benton interviewed the AMA president, Dr. Edward R. Annis. I have been firmly convinced in my own mind for a long time of the close, definite cause and effect relationship between the inhalation of cigarette smoke and the increasing number of lung cancer cases that I have seen in my 25 years of practice. The Surgeon General has called as a result of the report for all sorts of remedial action. He said he's also anxious to see what the American Medical Association will do. What will it do? What can it do? Well, of course, I think the answer to this and many problems is one of education. We still have people in this country die from tetanus, for example, even though we have the means at our disposal to prevent this disease. Dr. Annis, the AMA has started its own research program into this problem. And it's been suggested by some people, very bluntly, that this is a device to refute the report, perhaps even some sort of collusion with the tobacco industry. What is your answer to this? That such a charge is utterly ridiculous and absurd. The AMA cooperated with the Surgeon General in the selection of his committee. They cooperated in making material available. Great numbers of the American Medical Association's doctors' reports are incorporated in the report. We are very much in accord with this report. The American Heart Association today welcomed the report on smoking and health as an important contribution to public understanding of the health hazards associated with cigarette smoking. Dr. John J. Sampson, the president of the association, said that the report confirms the position taken by the association last June 8th when it called for active discouragement of cigarette smoking as an activity harmful to health. Among scientists, one of the prime movers in the issue has been Dr. Kyler Hammond, director of statistical research for the American Cancer Society. He was a co-author of the 1954 report on smoking and cancer that brought the issue into the public forum. Today in our studios, Dr. Hammond commented on the report of the Surgeon General's Committee. Dr. Hammond, what do you think of the most significant implications of the report issued today? Well, I think the most, first most significant thing is that the, this government committee came to the same conclusions that the great majority of scientists had in all previous commissions. Uh, from a practical standpoint, it means a number of agencies, government agencies, that had been delaying taking any sort of action until this report came out, uh, can now enter into a real program to do something about it. Now, I'm not thinking about legislation. I'm thinking of particularly the National Cancer Institute, the National Heart Institute, uh, are in a wonderful position to do research to uh, help solve this problem, perhaps developing a safe cigarette if that is possible. Uh, another thing is, I think it will give great impetus to the tobacco industry itself to intensify their research in order to try to develop a cigarette, uh, which I hope can be developed, which is relatively safe and at the same time gives pleasure. Now, we don't know that this can be done, but I certainly hope so. Well, do you feel that the only practical solution is the development of a cigarette that is not harmful. 
there are only two possible solutions. Mm -hmm. One is not to smoke, yeah. and uh, the other is to uh, have a, uh, or rather not to smoke cigarettes. I personally switch to a pipe. Um, the uh, only other solution is to develop a cigarette of a type that isn't uh, harmful. Now, we're not absolutely certain this can be done, but I have tremendous confidence in uh, the ability of American scientists to solve almost any problem of a technical nature. Tobacco has its private language, but it has become part of our public language, part of our literature, and a very large part of our economy. Billions of cigarettes a year, 500 billion to be exact, providing jobs for several million people, providing three and a third billion dollars in taxes to government, federal and state. About $170 million a year is spent to advertise cigarettes in all possible ways, including radio and television. So any news which seems likely to affect smoking habits is major news for the country as a whole, for the citizen as an individual. So far, in the developing concern about smoking and health, the national reaction has been to keep smoking. It has been noted that today's report is the culmination of a great many studies and a great deal of concern. It is as close as we can come in this country to an official and impartial statement of the facts. But it is also a beginning rather than an end. What happens now is the process of decision on what to do about it by government agencies, by the tobacco industry, by advertising media, newspapers and magazines, radio and television. CBS announced today that it is undertaking an immediate study of the report and will re-examine its advertising standards in light of the findings. ABC and NBC made similar statements. In addition, CBS, through its representative on the Television Code Review Board, will participate in a study of industry standards later this month. Above all, every American who smokes and every American youngster who is thinking of smoking must now consider whether to stop or not to start. It comes down to a subjective question. There is no question but what smoking has meant a great deal to a great many people. An old smoker never forgets how he started, and through the lifetimes of a lot of us, cigarettes have been an intimate and reassuring companion. The familiar slogans, the familiar packages, have been a part of our lives. It's like being told that an old friend has all along been betraying you. In a case like that, you give the old friend every possible chance before you finally decide to believe what you have been told, and maybe even then you give him a chance to reform. In this kind of a country, it comes down to you whether you like it or not. No one is going to forbid an adult to smoke, and it is now quite clear that no one is going to tell him it's good for him either. The decision is his, the decision and the health that may depend on it. This is Harry Reasoner. Good night. This has been a CBS News Extra on smoking and health. This broadcast has been produced under the supervision and control of CBS News.